And now, a reading from Luke. Before time itself was measured, the voice was speaking. The voice was and is God. This celestial word remained ever present with the Creator. His speech shaped the entire cosmos. Immersed in the practice of creating, all things that exist were birthed in him. His breath filled all things with a living, breathing light, a light that thrives in the depths of darkness, blazes through murky bottoms. It cannot and will not be quenched. Six months later in Nazareth, a city in the province of Galilee, the heavenly messenger Gabriel made another appearance. This time the messenger was sent by God to meet with a virgin named Mary, who was engaged to a man named Joseph and descendant of King David himself. The messenger entered her home and said, Greetings, you are favored, and the Lord is with you. The heavenly messenger's word baffled Mary, and she wondered what type of greeting was this. And the messenger continued, Mary, don't be afraid. You have found favor with God. Listen, you are going to become pregnant. You will have a son, and you will name him Savior, or Jesus Jesus will become the greatest among men. He will be known as the son of the highest God. God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over the covenant family of Jacob forever. Mary looked and said, but I have never been with a man. How is this possible? And the messenger said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The most high will overshadow you. That's why this holy child will be known as not just your son, but also the Son of God. It sounds impossible, but listen. You know your relative, Elizabeth, has been unable to bear children and is now far too old to be a mother. Yet she has become pregnant, as God willed it. Yes, in three months she will have a son. So the impossible is possible with God. Then Mary, deciding in her heart, said, Here I am. The Lord's humble servant, servant, as you have said, let it be done to me. And then the heavenly messenger was gone. Mary immediately got up and hurried to the hill country in the province of Judah, where her cousins, Zacharias and Elizabeth, lived. When Mary entered their home and greeted Elizabeth, who felt her baby leap in her womb, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth began shouting, You are blessed, Mary, blessed among all women, and the child you bear is blessed. And blessed am I as well, that the mother of my Lord has come to me. As soon as I heard your voice greet me, my baby leapt for joy within me. How fortunate you are, Mary, for you believed that what the Lord told you would be fulfilled. And then Mary said, my soul lifts up the Lord. My spirit celebrates God, my liberator. For though I'm God's humble servant, God has noticed me. Now and forever, I will be considered blessed by all generations. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is God's name. From generation to generation, God's loving kindness endures for those who revere God. God's arm has accomplished mighty deeds. The proud in mind and heart God has sent away in disarray. The rulers from their high positions of power, God has brought down low. And those who were humble and lowly, God has elevated with dignity. The hungry, God has filled with fine food. The rich, God has dismissed with nothing in their hands. To Israel, God's servant, God has given help as promised to our ancestors, remembering Abraham and his descendants in mercy forever. Mary stayed with Elizabeth in Judea for the next three months and then returned to her home in Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This next song 
is joyful, joyful, we adore thee. As you will witness in the documentary we're going to discuss in the sermon, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony is the basis for the tune of Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. It has been a powerful witness to the human spirit to overcome adversity. And then British punk rock star Billy Bragg once wrote an alternative translation of the original German choral score for a school teacher to teach her children in their classroom. And it soon became a popular anthem, even being performed for the Queen of England. In the words that he will sing, you can hear the call to resist division, to raise our voices, to furnish every heart with joy, and to banish all hatred for good. Let us watch and listen.
voyez, ça devient comme quelque chose qui vraiment qui, qui vrille là le corps, hein. C'est pas. Donc, donc, au fond du cœur, vraiment, vous sentez qu'il y a quelque chose de joie, de sentiment vers Beethoven. We've, this Advent, been looking at music. And while we're not able to gather together and lift our voices together in the sanctuary, that music connects us. There's something about it that truly connects us and helps people in the midst of despair to be able to live up to the Advent principles that we're looking at. And this week, we're looking at joy. Joy! This week, we turn to Luke's writing which is an account in two acts. The gospel biography of Jesus and then the story of the early church, the Jesus community. Whether you were a Jew or Gentile in those days deciding to become a part of the illegal early Christian movement, it could be punishment for your allegiance. Surely the message in both Luke and Isaiah was that the downcast, the lowly, the oppressed would rise up is welcome, an inspirational account for those who are in a time of being persecuted, of feeling low. Like the Jewish exiled people of Isaiah's time, and like the early Christians, we sometimes wonder where God is in our suffering. In the midst of a pandemic, how could God let this happen? We long to hear the promise that a reason for joyful praise is the good news that is on the way from God. Now, a reminder, and, and we had a whole series uh, last year about joy. I shared with you that joy is not the same as happiness. Joy is something we can have in our soul, even in hard times. You see, happiness comes and goes. Happiness is based on an event. You have something hap happen that is really good, and you're happy. But joy, joy is something that can be within you even in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death, even in the valley of darkness and sorrow, you can still have an e in internal joy that comes from knowing God, of knowing that God is in the midst of this and you are not alone, of knowing that no matter what happens, that through Christ you have an eternal joy time with God who created the world. It's a joy that's there through good times and bad. That's the joy that we want. That's the joy that when people see it within us as Christians, they say, I want some of that. And then we can share about how Jesus Christ and our faith, our belief gives us strength and hope and joy in those hard times. The reading from Isaiah is late in the book, and he is moved towards talking about rebuilding. Certainly, the work to remove barriers from my people's road is a long haul in terms of reconstructing the entrenched roads of injustice that society has created. We must continue to tend to the hearts that have felt crushed. Joy comes in our work, step by step, to break down barriers, and strength comes in trust that God is working alongside us, inviting us to keep checking in about our penchant to shear the road off course again and again into places of hatred. Let us not do that. The scripture from Isaiah, it shall be said, build up, build up, prepare the way, remove every obstruction from my people's way. 
For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I will dwell in the high and holy place and also with those who are contrite and humble in spirit to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart of the contrite. For I will continually accuse I will not continually accuse, nor will I always be angry. For then the spirit would grow faint before me, even the souls that I have made. Because of their wicked covetousness, I was angry. I struck them. I hid, I hid and was angry. But they, came, they kept turning back to their own ways. I have seen their ways, but I will heal them. I will lead them and repay them with comfort, creating for their mourners the fruit of the lips. And like the community to whom Isaiah wrote, we know we are in mourning. We know that we need words of comfort from God. And like those in exile, we need to look ahead and trust that there will be reason to give praise. God says, for those who mourn, I will create a reason for praise. I will heal them. Those words from Isaiah hold true for us this day with all that we're struggling with. And then the reading from Luke. We turn to, to Luke's original story. Luke is a journalist, and this longest book of the four Gospels details the events of Jesus' birth as an important way of understanding who Jesus really is. It is a way to help non Jews get the facts, not just the rumors, so they can see Jesus' saving presence for them. And it starts off so beautifully. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. And then the second part of the reading this morning. To the fledgling community, Christian communities, Mary's poem, The Magnificat, would have read like a rallying protest speech calling for justice and putting powerful words in the mouth of the self-proclaimed servant. Some in those early communities would have heard their own occupation reflected in that word. Joy. Deep human thriving can happen in the midst of oppression when people are inspired to raise their voices, to raise up to the full height and proclaim their worth. Now, Mary would have been scared. Mary would have been really scared. Here this angel comes and tells her that she is going to be pregnant. In that community, she is not been married to Joseph yet? What were they going to think? She would have been scared. It was not going to be easy. If you th think it would be easy, think about it. If you were a pregnant teenager and you have to go around and tell people, no, 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 it wasn't from any man. Try telling him that, uh, that you didn't cheat on the man that you're supposed to marry. That the baby is from God and the Holy Spirit is the one that impregnated you. Try to think about what it would mean to go around and say that to people. Oh, and even if your family and the guy you're going to marry believe in you, just think about the rumors that were going around in the community about her. And yet she decides to say that she is blessed, even in the hardship. And that this hardship she trusts will bring her joy. That is the joy that can only come from faith in God and entrusting it what God is doing. When we have that faith, we can enter into those times. We can go out and do things, even though people might be looking at us, they might be saying things about us. Oh, they're one of those people. There's one of those Jesus freaks. There's one of those people that constantly talks about Jesus. Oh, you know, if we go out to dinner with them, they're going to pray before the meal. 
Yeah, you know, people talk about people. And in the midst of that, we can still have that inner joy saying, you know what? I'm doing this for the Lord. I know God is in the midst. And do it with joy. The poem, the Magnificat, ends in verse 56. And I think this is interesting. And Mary remained with Elizabeth about three months and then returned home. When this started, she was told, you're pregnant uh, and and you're going to have God's baby. It says she immediately got up and went to see Elizabeth. She didn't know what to tell anybody else. And she had heard that Elizabeth also was having something happen to her that was unbelievable. So that's where she went. And she stayed there three months. She had three months that she got the courage to go back and to tell family and to tell Joseph and to face the community. It was not going to be easy. And yet, and yet she is going to find a way to be faithful and in the midst of it, experience joy. Joy that comes in the midst of all that will confront her. She will have that steadfast joy that can only come from faith in God. Now, let's talk about Ludwig von Beethoven. Ludwig von Beethoven was was born December 16th, 1770 in Bonn, Germany. If you do the math, this coming week would be the 250th anniversary of his birth and his baptism, because he was baptized the, the day after his birth. It's coming up this week. He began to learn to play the piano at a very young age and was encouraged by his father to practice for hours, hoping that he would be a famous musician. When he was 16, Beethoven traveled to Vienna, the cultural center of Europe at that time, where he met the greatest composer of the classical period, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. When he was a young man, Beethoven became a student of another classical master, Franz Joseph Haydn. He incorporated much of what he had learned from these composers into his own music, but he also developed his own style, which was powerful and passionate, ushering in the romantic era of classical music Beethoven, though, began losing his hearing when he was nearly 30 years old and was almost completely deaf by the time he was 44. It was an incredible challenge for him, personally and musically. He felt incredibly isolated and alone. Still, he continued to compose and write some of his most influential pieces even after he had become deaf. Beethoven lived during the Age of Enlightenment, a time of great change in Europe, when people questioned their, the traditional institutions, customs, and morals. He was inspired by the ideals of freedom and equality that were on display during the French Revolution, and his Ninth Symphony celebrates the idea of brotherhood and fraternity for all. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony was first performed on May 7th, 1824, after he had completely lost his hearing. Even though he couldn't hear, Beethoven insisted on conducting the piece himself. At the end, the audience applauded wildly, but Beethoven didn't know the piece was finished until one of the soloists plucked him by the sleeve and directed his attention to the clapping hands and waving hats and handkerchiefs. And then he turned to the audience, and he bowed. Beethoven was inspired by a poem written by Frederick Schiller in 1785. The poem personifies joy and describes the intoxicating spiritual feeling that joy gives. Schiller also states that in a new age, the old ways will no longer divide people, and that with joy, all men become brothers. Beethoven did not use the whole poem, but he was inspired by the first section. And that first section goes, Joy, beautiful spark of divinity, daughter of Elysium, we enter drunk with fire, heavenly one, thy sanctuary. Thy magic binds again what custom strictly divided. All people become brothers where they gentle wing abides. And then the closing verse, I love, so I'm just going to read it to you because I love it. It was not used as part of Beethoven's Ninth and the Ode to Joy, 
but it ends. Go on, brothers, your way. Joyful like a hero to victory. Be embraced, millions. This, this kiss to all the world. Brothers, above the starry canopy, there must dwell a loving father. Are you collapsing, millions? Do you sense the creator, world? Seek him above the starry canopy. Above the stars must he dwell. Hmm. It's a powerful poem. Following the Ninth is a documentary film about the global impact of Beethoven's final symphony. The film, released in mid-2013, has been screened in over 250 cities in the United States and around the globe. R written in 1824, near the end of Beethoven's life, the Ninth Symphony was composed by a man that had little to be thankful for. Sick, alienated from almost everyone, and completely deaf, Beethoven had never managed to find love nor create the family he'd always wanted. And yet, despite this, he managed to create an anthem of a joy that embraced the transcendence of beauty over suffering. Celebrated to this day for its ability to heal, repair, and bring people together across great divides, the ninth has become an anthem of liberation and hope that has inspired many around the world. At Tiananmen Square in 1989, students played the ninth over loudspeakers as the army came in to crush their struggle and freedom and actually crush people that were before the tanks. In Chile, women living near the Pinochet dictatorship sang the ninth at torture prisons where men inside took hope when they heard their voices ringing out the song Ode to Joy. As the Berlin Wall came down in December 1989, it collapsed to the sound of Leonard Bernstein conducting Beethoven's ninth as an ode to freedom. And in Japan, each December, the ninth is performed hundreds of times, often with 10,000 people in the chorus. It was even saying after this earthquake and tsunami of 2011. There's also another wonderful movie looking at the Ninth Symphony and the joy it has brought to people in the midst of death and tyranny. It's called Beethoven's Ninth, a symphony for the world. Both of the ones I'm talking about are on YouTube and Amazon if you want to watch them. I'm, I'm tying that in because lots of people are at home and are looking for something. And these are inspirational documentary pieces that will that will help educate you, but also just lift you up. I liked, I, I watched both of them and it just brought me joy. Here's a, here's a little clip from one of them. Everything will pass and the world will perish, but the Ninth Symphony will remain. The whole thing is a kind of creation story or an evolution story. I mean, the first, the first, first thing is not a thing, it's a nothing. What on earth is that? And then when it, when it starts to move, the spirit of God hovering over the waters, what you get is Then you have this cataclysmic event. It's pure violence. That is primordial violence. That is the Big Bang. This peace enters your bloodstream and then changes who you are. The entire blueprint of everything, all the way from subatomic particles to galactic clusters, it's all here. From Tiananmen Square, where it was played over the loudspeakers during the revolution. Which created an uh, ambiance of hope for us. To the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin, where it was played when the wall fell down. I wish every person on this planet could experience this moment. It seems to express most completely what human beings 
are struggling for, what's possible for mankind. Pinochet took the power and it began a very dark time. One day I heard the Ninth Symphony. It was us having the colorful butterfly in our heart. It was fantastic. It was uh, hope. That disaster tsunami reunited the Japanese people. What happened is just like Daiku, Daiku concept. People became brothers. I encourage you this week to go and watch one of those. They're also on, as I said, on YouTube, or if you have Amazon Prime, you can watch it that way. But after hearing about Mozart, after hearing about Mary and other people that have gone through hard times and have found a way to sing a song of joy, can you find joy in this season? Can you find joy in this season? Even if, even if you're struggling with depression, can you find an inner joy that, that helps you even in the midst of the sorrow to know that God is with you and walks beside you? That when you're in those moments that God is holding you in his arms, and that it will give you joy even in the midst of that anxiety and sorrow and sadness? Can you find joy in this season even if you cannot buy the presents for other people that you wish that you could give to them? Can you realize that it's more than that, that you can find ways, other ways, to show them love, and that it's all right, and to find joy even in the midst of poverty, and sorrow. Can you find joy in this season even if you can't gather together to have that annual family gathering that you have every year during the Christmas season where family comes together and laughs and shares, and this year it's not going to be able to happen? Will you still be able to have that joy that should sustain you even in the time of loss of a valued tradition for this year? I could go on and on. All of you know what is bringing you low, causing you pain, anxiety, grief. Can you find the joy to help you to, during this time? Can you find that joy? As I said, it's not happiness. It's all right. You can still have that inner joy of faith in God and trust that God is with you even as you're crying, even as you're experiencing moments of sadness, but there's this joy that undergirds it all that allows you to know that there is still something to look forward to, that it's all right to, to experience some moments of laughter in the midst of the sadness, that after you've had that cry that you can get up from the bed and then you can ex hold your head high and you still can go forth to live life. That's the joy that God can give us, that our faith in God and trusting that God is with us can give us. That's the joy that we want as Christians. I believe in God. And when I believe in God, there should be this joy that fills my life through the ups and the downs. That's the joy that we're talking about this Advent. That's the joy that we want to be able to have. It's something that can help us and sustain us as people, as individuals, and as the church, and as a nation, and as a global world. Those that have faith can, can realize that we can overcome the divisions of this world as God connects us as brothers and sisters in Christ. We can be the ones that live in to that joy live into the Magnificat that Mary gave, that we are connected. The, the song, the Ode to Joy, that says that brothers, sisters, all is one, we can raise our voices in joy, even in the midst of a global pandemic. We can do that. Let us pray. Holy One, we come to you in this Advent season 
unlike any other. And just like there have been Advent seasons filled with war and famine that have brought people low, that they have had to overcome, this year we come to Advent in the midst of a pandemic. Lord, we ask that you might instill in us joy that even as things are not as normal, that those things that often provide us happiness may not happen this year, that we can still have joy. Give that to us, O Lord. Let it be a blessing that is bestowed upon us this year. And then, Lord, have us share it with the world. Give that gift of joy to people that are struggling in the midst of a pandemic, something that can help them in their lives. Lord, help us to be those conveyors of joy. First you gave to us, now let us gift joy to others. We pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. A couple of announcements. Uh, I do want to let you know that we will be having Christmas Eve services, but they will not be in the church. We are going to use the promised land uh, and have two services, one at 5 and one at 7 o'clock. 5 o'clock is going to have the Faith Boys. They are uh, some teenage boys that we had this summer that everybody was just amazed by their singing and their presence. And so they are going to come and lead us through a praise service at the Promised Land at 5 o'clock. We've already started to decorate there. If you drive by 140 at night, you'll start to see the lights up on the hill. We're going to put them up there so that not just on Christmas Eve, but throughout the season, people can go by and see them. And we want to bring them joy. We also want to let them know that we're up there and that they might be able to join us. We will have FM radio going. People don't even have to get out of their vehicles to hear what is going on because it might be cold and you might want to stay warm. So it'll be possible, uh, except for those of us that are leading the service and be, be praying for your tech team, because uh, they'll be out in the cold also. We do have a couple of heaters, but for the space we have, it, uh, it doesn't fully do the job. It's not going to be toasty warm, uh, but we come together to give praise to God. And uh, so let your friends and neighbors know about that. With that, I want to go to our last hymn, the hymn of joy, joyful, joyful. Wherever you are, I ask for you to rise up uh, and to sing along with this. When this ends, have your uh, candle ready to lift up. We're going to have a, a benediction that you'll be a part of that includes the candle. And then there will be a ringing of the bells. Joyful, joyful, the hymn of joy. Just how to love 
each other Lift us to the joy divine Mortals join the mighty chorus Which the morning star has begun Father, love is reigning o'er us Brother, love binds man to man Ever singing, march we onward Victors in the midst of strife Joyful music lifts us onward In the triumph songs of life As I said, you are now invited to pick up this week's candle and hold it high for the benediction. We wait for justice, but we do not wait to work for change. We wait for restored health, but we do not wait to work hard to heal. We wait for wholeness, but we do not wait to work at finding brokenness. We wait for peace, but we do not wait to work to eliminate hatred. And so, my friends, like bells ringing out the news that God is ever present with us, fill the night left by sadness with messages of joy. Go into your lives humming the tunes that keep that joy alive in you and that spur you on in your work of justice and reconciliation. Raise your voices and repeat after me. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Amen.